Over the years I've reviewed quite a few different budget car cameras, well the time's finally come to review something a little bit more upmarket because Pitasoft have sent me through their top of the range Blackview car camera. This model is the DR500GW HD and it's a fully spec'd one, it's got built in Wi-Fi, full 1080p HD, built in GPS, voice guide and it also works with iOS and Android apps. But their generosity didn't stop there because they didn't just send me that, they also sent me this as well. This is the PowerMagic Pro. This is an uninterruptible power supply for your car. The idea is you wire it into your fuse box and then the car has got a continuous power supply that you can power the camera with so that you can record things while it's parked. Now I'm not going to be installing this inside my car during the review, but what I'll do, I'll demonstrate to you how it would work and what it entails. So of course there is the 12 volt power supply there that you'd put somewhere in your car. On the other end of that you've got a little bit of a plug which plugs into the Power Magic Pro box. And on the uh, back of the Power Magic Pro you'd stick this 3M double sided tape. You could also screw it to your car somewhere, hide it underneath the dashboard. You don't really need to be able to get to it. And then we'll just have a look around the box itself. There isn't really much to see on here. Um, on this side of course that's where you plug it in and then on the back here you've got some uh, you've got an on off switch uh, an LED and then some dip switches I'll explain what those dip switches do but basically once you've set them that's it and you just hide it away somewhere underneath your dash so let's have a look at the instruction booklet now it looks a little bit scary but it's not such a big deal really all you've got are three wires to attach you find the fuse box in your car one wire goes to something where the power is switched on when you turn the car on the other wire goes to to something where the power is continuously on whether the car's on or off and then the other thing goes to an earth point somewhere on the car and then you set the dip switches the first two of these indicate the minimum voltage that you want your car battery to go to if it goes below this the camera will switch off that stops your battery from going flat and then the last three dip switches indicate how many hours you want the device to stay on after your car has had its engine switched off. Either 6, 12, 24, 36, 48, 72, 120 or on continuously. Okay, so that's the PowerMagic Pro. As I say, I'm not going to install it. I hope you get an idea what it does. Basically, it allows you to power the camera when your car is switched off. Right, let's look at the main event. It's the camera itself. We'll get inside the box and see exactly what you get with this. Well, it's very nicely packaged. There it is at the top. We'll just take that out. And below that, we've got a few accessories. So we'll just tip those out as well. And let's lay all these things out and see what we've got. Right, well, this is it. You've got one of those 3M double-sided sticky tape things, which goes on the bottom of here, but it's already got one on. So that's a spare for you there. You've got these little things here, which are cable clips. As you can see, that's for routing the cable around your car. And then on the back of each of those, again, they've got some sticky tape, double-sided stuff on there to hold them to maybe your windscreen or something along the top if you wanted to. This is a micro SD USB card reader. The camera doesn't connect to your computer with this one. You take the SD card out of the camera, put it in the memory card reader, plug that into a USB port on your computer. The lead that comes with it comes with this nice right angle plug. I much prefer these to the ones where the cable sticks out of the top. It's a nice long cable as four and a half meters or about 15 feet with a right angle barrel plug on the end of that. And then we've got the instruction leaflet. Now this is all in English from front to back. Obviously they'll supply the correct one for the country where it's being sold. And it's nicely printed with color photos throughout and perfectly understandable, nice and clear. I'll just take the protective coating and the lens cap off and we'll have a look at the camera itself. Well, as you can see, it's a really nice looking camera. We've got a nice big glass lens on there, which should get a lot of light into it. We'll test that in low light later on. It's got this kind of rotating device here, which is what you hold it in, of course. Enables you to point it up and down, uh, spin it all the way around if you really wanted to. Uh, you press that lock button there, that unlocks it and you can remove it from the holder and that's how you get the camera out now let's just have a look on the back of here you've got a couple of leds record and gps which will no doubt light up when it gets a lock there's the speaker probably got a microphone behind there as well i'm not entirely sure where the mic is but it's got one somewhere 
There is an LED on the front, a white one as well, just below the lens, which they call the security LED. And then on this side here, we've got a touch sensitive or a proximity sensor type device behind there and a little LED to show when the Wi-Fi is on. And then on the other end, that's the way you turn the Wi-Fi on and off with that button there. And yeah, that's where the power lead goes into it. If we take the end off here, you can see that's where the micro SD card goes. And there's actually one in this camera. They supply a 16 gigabyte class 10 card, which is a good thing to do because it means you're ready to go out of the box. There's also a little reset button behind there as well if you needed to use that. Now you see these holes on here, that's for ventilation because these things do get rather warm. And of course, if it's in a car windscreen, it's gonna get even warmer if the sun's on it. Now let's just have a look at this little clip. As you can see, there's the 3M tape. You can see how it works. When you press the lock button, the little catch moves in and out, which is what holds it in the holder. But you can just click it back in. You don't have to press the lock button to get it back in there. Now let's power it up and see what happens. Initializing the SD card. When you first power it on with a new SD card in there, it initializes a card. And what that means is it copies across the files and folders that it needs onto that card. And we're going to use some of that software later on for playback. Black view for your safe driving. Starting normal recording. You may be glad to know that you can adjust the volume of those voices or switch them off entirely if you want. Oh, by the way, that's the security LED that's now flashing on the front of the camera to show it's recording. OK, so I'll show you how I've got it installed in the car. Well, it's up behind the rear view mirror and you can't see it at the moment, which is perfect. If I bring the camera around here, you can see that that's where it is there behind the mirror. Of course, that means the passenger can see it, but I can't. Now, one thing that you can't see from this angle is any of the indicator lights on the device, which is where those voice prompts come in very handy because you know that the device is recording. As you can see, the camera can be rotated quite easily in its holder to point exactly how you want it. If you're in a big HGV, you might need it pointing down or in a sports car, pointing up a little bit. In my car, I can just point it straight forward. And I find that the nice wide angle lens will capture the whole depth of the windscreen as well as all the width. In this end of the camera, it doesn't look like there are any buttons, but there's actually a light sensor on the left that if I cover it up with my finger... Audio recording disabled. It turns the audio off. And of course, to switch it back on, you just have to do the same thing again. Starting audio recording. And then the other thing on this side is a little blue light, which indicates when the Wi-Fi is switched on. Wi-Fi off. Wi-Fi on. Now, the Wi-Fi button does have another function. If you were to hold it down for a few seconds, it will format the card, which you could find useful if you want to wipe everything that's on it. OK, I've moved over to the passenger side because I want to show you how easy it is to remove the camera. I'll move the mirror out of the way so you can see this, but normally you can do it just by feeling for it. What you have to do is you just press the button on the front of the holder, and then slide the camera to the left like that. Take that with you. What happens is the wire that's this barrel plug gets left behind because it pulls against the loop and stays in the car there. So it's quite easy to remove it. A little bit more tricky, I suppose, to put it back in because you have to click it in there, but then you also have to put the power lead in at the bottom, which unfortunately I'll put a little bit too near the mirror, I think, which makes it a little bit fiddly for me to get in. But there you go, it's in. So that's it. Very easy to take out when you park up and walk away with it. Now we're going to look at some test footage here. Now this is from my first trip out in the car and I haven't got everything set up exactly how I would like. As you can see at the bottom left there, the speed is in kilometers per hour and I prefer miles per hour. Also, I've got the video compression rate set to high compression, which will mean that things are a little bit more blocky than if I were to set it to low compression, which would obviously use more bit rates. I'm going to change those settings around later on. I've also got to do a bit of adjusting with the camera angle as well. I need to point it a little bit further down, I think. I'll explain why in a bit. But as you can see, really, overall, it's looking all right. It's pretty decent quality. This is in the 1080p 30 mode as well. Now, we'll just see what the sound quality is like. 
Right, so this is my first journey in the car with the camera installed and we'll see what this footage looks like. It's a, quite a pleasant day actually, it's mid-afternoon, quite bright, so the video in conditions are just about perfect. Hopefully you'll be able to hear my voice quite clearly on the recording. Now when I got home I noticed that quite a bit of the footage I shot was too dark and also quite a bit of it had this fluctuating brightness issue that you can see on screen now and I think that's because the camera is focusing on getting the exposure right for the sky rather than the road and that's probably because I've got it pointed a little bit too high so there's too much sky in shot so I'll need to adjust that. But I also want to show you the software. Now the software is one of the best features of this camera, but it's going to take me about 10 minutes to talk about it all. So I'm warning you now, if you're not interested in this, jump forwards 10 minutes because you'll need the patience of a saint to get through this. Anyway, I'll show you how it works. So the first thing is you remove the micro SD card from the camera, put it in the supplied card reader, and then plug that into the USB port on your computer. Right, I'm using a Mac, but I'd imagine that this is very similar on a PC. The drive shows up on the desktop. Click on the drive, you can see that there's one folder in there called Blackview. If we expand that, there's some subfolders, and I'll show you what's in each of these. Well, the first one, Application, has viewers for PC and Mac. Of course, I'm going to use the Mac one. I'll just drag that across to my desktop, so I've got a copy on there. The next folder down is config. This is just something that's read by the camera. You can read these in a Word document if you want, but uh, there's no need to because it's configured by the other application. So just ignore that one. The doc folder has the manual on as a PDF, which is nice if you want to have a look at that. As you can see, there it is. So we'll just close that. In fact, I'll keep a copy of that over there as well. The next one down, record, that's where all the video files go, I'll show you that in a second. Software, something else for the PC there, I haven't tried that one of course, but I'm not too sure what that is. And then in the system here there's some more stuff just for the camera to look at. So if we go in the record folder you can see this is where all the video files are. Now the way that the file system works is, for each event there are three files. You can see there there's a 3GF, there's a GPS and there's an MP4 file. I'd imagine the 3GF sort of combines the other two, but don't quote me on that. So if you look at an MP4 file, of course, that's the video file. Whoops. And if we click on one of those, we can just watch it on screen like this. So obviously you can just copy those across, combine them together, whatever you want. Now I will show you how it works with the viewer program next. So we'll just uh, close this down and just load up the viewer. Okay, so if we click on the viewer, it loads the software, as you can see it's loading up. Let's make it full screen so it's uh, nice and easy to see. Okay, so this is the viewer program. As you can see, there's quite a few bits and pieces around the screen, different icons and things. I'll talk you around them as best as I can. So, you can see at the bottom here we've got hours, minutes and seconds and the date. So you can jump to any time and date just by clicking on it. So if we look at uh, 1429 for example, just click there I'm citing a queue of traffic which shows that it's that file there as well you can also jump between files by clicking on the right hand side if you want uh, just double tap to play but if we go back to this one here so this is the file playing at the top there obviously you've got some controls there to jump back and forward to it you can also speed it up a little bit you've got a dragger here where you can move it up to uh, is that uh, 1.8 is the maximum there or down to slower speed 0.2 and then of course you can adjust the volume for the uh, clip as well and also you got the ability to flip the video in case you had the camera the other way up inside your car which is nice and you can make it full screen like that or if I press escape it'll bring it back down to just the video there now you can see here this because I'm not moving this isn't really doing an awful lot so let's just try and jump forward one clip and we'll see the different bits of information here these are the G sensors the uh, G4 sensors moving as I go around the corner there you can see that must be the sideways one the green one and then we've got up and down and forward and back and things now as I'm driving down here we can click on a map if we want by pressing the map button and that shows where I am at the moment so we can change it between a satellite view or a map and we can zoom in of course as well Thinks I'm driving down a field there, which is obviously wrong. My GPS must be a little bit out. That's the coordinates, and that's the current speed. Kilometers per hour, can switch that to miles per hour by clicking there as well. 
and GPS shows it has a GPS lock on, which is a little bit weird that I'm there, isn't it? Let's try moving along to the next clip and see if it sort of figures it out. No, according to this, I'm moving through the middle of nowhere. Okay, well that's fine. Uh, let's turn the volume off there. Now, I want to show you a couple of things up here. You can just click that one and get the map out. Ah, that one's got a better map on it, showing sort of the accurate thing on that one, isn't it? And then uh, if I click up here, I can take a photo and save it. Or if we click up there, we can print it out if we really wanted to print an image of the current uh, position. So that's pretty much it on the screen here. Of course, you can scrub back and forward through the video to get to the relevant part and the map will update accordingly. It's very weird, that map thing. I'm not too sure what's going on there. Okay, right. Now I want to show you something later on in the trip. So I think it's happened at sort of four... Tw uh, 20 no, four. Well, so about there no oh, the notice these red dots here this is where there's been an event that's where an event is when your car sort of makes a movement that the camera recognizes as being a sudden movement either up down or forward or back now the one i wanted to show you was actually just here now unfortunately the screen is rather dark and that's because the camera you can see is getting the brightness from the sky more than the road because unfortunately I had it pointed a little bit too high on some later clips I've pointed it accurately right there we go there's a guy just walks right in front of the car which is quite interesting watch this chap now and I have to slam on a little bit notice the g-force sensors at the top there that's the big slam on and that created a red file now if we go on the file list here and try and find out where we are that's the one there E is for event and every time something that it thinks is an event happens, it puts it in the event category. So the one before it there, the normal one, let's just click on that. So this was normal up to the point of when we got near that chap. So we just go to the end here. Now notice what happens, watch the clip on the right there. As we slam on here, it makes a new file. It wasn't at the end of its file, it just created a new one a few seconds before and after and saved it as an event there with the chap walking in front of the car. Now, on the right here, we can filter these down. We can just have just the events on, as you can see there, or we can have the events and the N for normal, and then P is parking. But unfortunately, because I haven't got the auto power thing set up, there are no parking events. But if you click them all on, you can see all the different events there. So I think that's the uh, playback software discussed properly, but let's just have a look at the settings on the camera. Now the settings are stored on the micro SD card that's in the computer at the moment. If I go up here and go to preferences, this is all the stuff that's on the camera. These are the camera settings and this is where you change them. Okay, so first thing that I did with mine, I made sure it was in 1920 by 1080 at 30 frames a second, but those are your different options there. Now those clips there, as I mentioned, were rather blocky. That's because I had the video compression on high. That's what it came with in the box. I've changed it to normal since that clip's been recorded. Now brightness, I did adjust the brightness up and down because I thought that the dark image was caused by me having the wrong brightness setting. It actually wasn't. It was because I had the camera pointed too much towards the sky and the exposure was getting set for the sky rather than anything else. So these settings on the right are what the camera automatically does when you first turn it on in the car. So you can have it record or not record. You can have it voice record or not record. So you actually have to press the button to get the voice recording on or vice versa. Date and time, this is what displays on the video clips. You can see that at the bottom left of the screen here. That shows on the video clip there, the date and the time. I've got that on and you can have the speed display in miles per hour, kilometers per hour or not at all. The record file units, that's how long you get each clip. You've got one, two or three minutes long. So that's the length of each clip. Between each clip, of course, there's no gaps at all. And the event time for parking, again, if you had the parking thing set up so it recorded, you can have one, two or three minutes length for those clips as well. And then you can change the way the memory card stores things so that you can have uh, how much percent you want of each event, normal or parking to take up the memory card. Just leave that as time as normal. Right, so that's the setting. Of course, time zone is for the sat nav to figure out where about you are in the time. Sensitivity is one that I've had to change. I've knocked everything quite low because it was getting all these sort of false reds where things weren't really happening. And sensitivity for parking mode doesn't matter because mine doesn't record during parking. And again, motion detection would be the same thing. And then on the Wi-Fi, you can change your SSID, you can change your password. 
And then also on the front of the camera, you notice it does have that LED on it. Uh, you can have it on or off. I think I'll turn that off, actually. And security LED for normal mode, on or off, and for parking mode. Not too sure what that's all about. I think there must be a red light flashing on there or something. This is the sound, you know, when it says uh, black view is recording, all that kind of stuff. You can turn any of those on or off as you wish, and you can also turn the volume of that voice up or down as you like. So that's pretty much it, and you save those to the file, then you eject the card and put it into your um, device again, and it will update the settings accordingly. Right, congratulations if you managed to get through all that bit without going to sleep. I'm now going to reward you with a little bit more footage, and I'll show you first of all what it looks like at night. As you can see, it's looking really rather good. Now I mentioned there that I've got the new settings on. One of the settings I've changed, you can see at the bottom left, the miles per hour. But another one I did, I knocked the brightness up one to see if that improved things, you know, with the dark issue that I was having. But actually at night time, it's not improving things. It's making it look a little bit sort of yellowy and misty. What I did is I went home, changed the setting back to zero, and this is what I got instead. So I'm going around the same junction now, and it actually looks better with the setting at zero. So not increasing the brightness, just letting the camera do what it wants to. And as you can see, the night footage is brilliant. You can see everything that you need to. It's nice and clear. All the colours are there and you can make out all the detail you need. Now, again, I'm going down this rather dark lane here, which sometimes comes out completely black on some lesser cameras on this one. It's doing a good job. Now, I'll show you what it looks like with the increased brightness on the left there from the previous journey. As you can see, it just makes it rather misty. You can't see any more information. So just leave the brightness on auto at night. That's something I've learned from that anyway. Now, let's go out in the day again. Now what I've done here, I've got the camera pointed a little bit lower down. You can see there's more of the dashboard in front of the camera there and less sky. And it's doing a pretty good job. This is going along the motorway, of course, so it's a nice clear image. Wait for the join under the bridge. And that was it. You didn't see anything there, did you? There was one clip used before the bridge and one after the bridge, and there's no noticeable join between them. I don't think it drops a single frame, so that's great. Now, I seem to have resolved the issue, or sometimes resolve the issue, with the brightness and darkness problem by moving the camera further down. It does still pop up every now and then. But one thing that I couldn't resolve was the fact that the image gets rather blocky at times. I've moved the compression to low, but look at it now. Everything's going very blocky on screen, very pixel and that's as I'm going past these trees and in the shadow next to them and that's because there's too much data for the camera to resolve in the amount of bandwidth it's got and the amount of kilobits per second that it stores the footage at it's all right when you're out in a nice clear open area like this but every time you get near sort of wooded areas shadows lots of stuff happening everything goes very pixelated and that's something that's a little bit annoying for me I was thinking that this camera would be pin sharp all the time. I don't like the way that every now and then it sort of drops back to 8-bit levels. So I thought I'd see what I can do, what's causing that. So I had a look at this chart first of all in the manual and this kind of gives it away a little bit. You can see at full 1080p, 30 frames a second, on a 32 gig card it will store 9 hours 24 minutes. That's about double what some cameras will do that I've tested which have a nice sharp image all the time. So it's using a very low bit rate. Now looking at the actual specs of the video file you can see that 1080p is using 7382 kilobits a second. That's pretty low. Now I tried it at 720p as well. This is what 720p looks like. And in a scene like this, it looks fine. But again, if you get into one of those scenes where there's a lot of trees around and shadows and things, it goes just as pixelated as the 1080p video does. And if I look at the specs for the 720p video, it's running at a really pretty low 4,979 kilobits a second. OK, it's time to look at the software again, but this time we're going to head into the garage because I'm going to take a look at the smartphone application. Right, now I'll need to switch the Wi-Fi on, so I'll just press the button at the end here. Wi-Fi on. OK, so now I've got the iPhone down here. I've got the application on it already, the Blackview application there. But what we need to do, we need to um, connect to the Wi-Fi hotspot that's been created by the uh, Blackview now. So we'll just wait for that to pop up on the screen here. There it is at the top. Apologies for the lack of tripod on this one. It's a little bit difficult for me to get a tripod inside the car. Right, we're connected now. So what we'll need to do, we'll go into the application. And it gives us a warning. We can get rid of that. 
click on the middle button there. As you can see here, now these are all the files that are on the camera. We've got the different colours like we had before. We've got orange for the events, green for the normal ones. And I've even got some blue ones up here, which are the ones for the parking. These have been getting recorded while I've got the car stood here with the power switched on. Okay, so now any of these clips here, we can play back by streaming them directly from the camera. I'll press this one, for example. We've got to turn it into a landscape mode. It will take a few seconds to get enough data across to the iPhone before it starts streaming it, but there you go. Now it will stutter every now and then because it is 1080p that you can see it's stuttering there. So you're really better off just sort of pausing it, waiting for it to catch up. You can see the bar moving across the top ever so slowly. Uh, the 1080p video must take a little while to stream across between the two devices. If you don't want to be doing that, you do have an option of saving a file to the iPhone. If you click on this one again, we've got an option here of copy to internal. And what that will do, that will copy the file across over Wi-Fi. You can see the bar moving ever so slowly there as it's copying across to the internal memory. Now that would be playable from this option up here, internal. If I click that, it comes up with a list, or it would do, of the files that are on the iPhone. And I can play those away from the black view while I haven't got the Wi-Fi connection. Now there's a few things on here that aren't exactly obvious. Uh, first one is settings. If you click on settings here, it just comes up with this screen, which doesn't seem to mean an awful lot. But you click on that bit there, and it enables me to get into all the settings on the camera. The same settings that you can get into on the desktop application. They're all on here, so you can change anything you want to. When you finish, save and upload at the bottom there. Now the other thing I couldn't figure out was how to get into the live view, you know, the live streaming from the camera, one of the major features of the Wi-Fi. Well, it's over the page here. If I just scroll across, it's there. There's the button for it. So if I click live now, you can see that's the live view that is uh, in front of the camera. Now I'll actually just, uh, I'll just twist the camera now. Let's see if we can do this all in one shot. Uh, not really, but you can see that you should be able to see it moving at the bottom there. I'll move a little bit closer. That beep is because it's spotted an event, by the way. I've got a beep switched on. It thinks it's gone over some sort of bump or something. But there you go. You can see that I'm moving the camera and it's moving pretty much instantaneously on the application. So there you go. That's the Blackview application. Those are the features of it. Um, and that's the main feature of the Wi-Fi Blackview over some of the other models in the range. I do find that the G sensors are overly sensitive and they keep recording events on the camera when nothing's really happened. Look at the video at the top left and look at the graphs along the bottom and just wait for the massive bang there. Did you see anything on the video? No, no I didn't either. I probably didn't feel anything, but it thought that pothole was sufficient to record an event. And that's even when I've got the sensitivity set right to the bottom. So I can't really stop it recording events when I hit a big pothole. And I never did resolve that issue I had earlier on with the maps. There's something very strange going on here. If I click on the map on this journey and zoom in a bit, it currently thinks I'm somewhere near Bradford, when in fact I'm about 60 odd miles to the left of that on the M65. So I don't know what that is. That's a really strange bug. But one thing I really do like is the software that's provided with this camera. I think it's brilliant. I mean, it works really smoothly. You're able to jump to any time or date or clip and see everything that you possibly want to see. In fact, one thing I didn't mention to you earlier on is the fact that you can actually pause the video or, and zoom in so you can see a registration number, which is handy. I also like the iPhone application. Now I've figured out where all the hidden options are. It's great. So overall, I really like the design of this camera. I also like a lot of the features like the ability to turn the sound on and off with a brush of the finger, the speech, and the fact that you can pull it out of the car very easily. But I do have some issues that I'd like to be resolved. The fact that the brightness focuses too much on the sky rather than the road is something that hopefully can be fixed with a firmware update. Now it might be slightly more tricky to fix the issue that I had with the overly compressed video, but if there's any possibility of increasing the kilobits a second from the rather measly 7000 and odd for 1080p, it would be very much appreciated. So I'm going to be keeping my eye on the Blackview website where they do put out pretty regular firmware updates 
updates for their products and hopefully they'll release a new firmware for this one that will fix those issues that I'm having. But for the moment, thanks for watching.